I am going to introduce these fabulous panelists, and then we're going to uh, start talking about um, why we're here in the first place. Not in an existential way. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with Susan Isaacs, who is right over there, and is probably the dean of writers on this panel. Um, she's a novelist, an essayist, a screenwriter. She was born in Brooklyn and educated at Queens College, so, you know, she's a local. Um, <laughs> And her first novel was Compromising Positions, which was uh, a, a, a kind of a revelation um, in, its, in its day. Um, she has won the Writers for Writers Award, the John Steinbeck Award. I would go on, but I won't. She is a member of the National Book Critics Circle, the Creative Coalition, PEN, the American Society of Journalists and Authors, the International Association of Crime Writers, and the Adams Roundtable. Um, she's a past president of the Mystery Writers of America. So she belongs here. And she has also um, written about politics, film, and First Amendment issues, which is not um, minor these days. <laughs> Hank Philippi Ryan is the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's NBC affiliate. She has won 33 Emmys. Let me say that again. She has won 33 <laughs> Emmys. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people your age who haven't won 33 <laughs> Emmys. Um, 13 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors for her groundbreaking journalism. Um, she has won, she's, she's written seven mystery, seven novels? The nine. One, one, nine, that's what I thought. <laughs> Who's, who sent me this? Um, <laughs> and she has won, for her fiction, five Agathas, the Anthony, the Daphne, the McCavity, and the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Um, national reviews have called her a master. Have called her a master at crafting suspenseful mysteries and a superb and gifted storyteller. That's what you get for being a news journalist. Um, she's a founding teacher at Mystery Writers of America University, and she was uh, uh, president of National Sisters in Crime. Lisa Lutz, who is between the two, um, is the New York Times best-selling author of, now this says nine novels, is that true, or? Uh, yeah, no, not, not oh, all okay. nine got on the New York Times. Oh, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, you don't yet. have to admit that. Yeah. <laughs> no, yet. <laughs> right, yet. She's also the author of the children's book, How to Negotiate Everything, which may not be something you want your children to read. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of letters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's won the Alex Award and has been nominated for the Edgar for Best Novel. And then it says here, I'm just reading this now um, verbatim. Although she attended UC Santa Cruz, UC Irvine, the University of Leeds in England, and San Francisco State, she still does not have a bachelor's degree, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is its own kind of success. Um, <laughs> she spent most of the 1990s hopping through a string of low-paying odd jobs while writing and rewriting the screenplay Plan B, a mob comedy. After the film was made in 2000, she vowed she would never write another screenplay. <laughs> and on the end, Laura Jo Rowland, who is the best-selling author of a, of a mystery series set in 17th century Japan that features samurai detective Sano Ichiro. She also wrote a historical suspense series that char stars Charlotte Bronte. Mm -hmm. um, her work has been published in 21 countries, nominated for the Anthony, the Hammett, and the Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers Award. She's won the Romantic Times Magazine's Reader's Choice Award and been included in the Wall Street Journal's list of the five best historical mystery novels. Uh, the 18th and final book in the series, which I hate to hear that anybody has written a final book in a series, so maybe we'll ask her about that, is The Iris Fan, and that is for sale in the back, along with books from all these other fabulous writers. So you can buy lots of books when you leave because there's a new snowstorm coming over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and um, her new book, The Ripper's Shadow, is a thriller set in Victorian England about guess who. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Michigan, and get this, she is a former aerospace scientist, a painter, and a cartoonist. <laughs> so. Welcome to the, <laughs> welcome to the, <laughs> what are we doing here panel? <laughs> okay, so, so here's the thing. Um, when I was asked to moderate this panel, I actually thought about it, and I, um, Imagine. <laughs> and I, and I almost said, nah, you know, um, because the whole concept of a women crime writers panel 
is that there is something different about women crime writers from the default of crime writers, which is straight white men. Um, you, you get this, you get the ethnic detective panel, you get the writers of color panel, you know, and then you get the normal panel. Um, and this happens at every uh, crime convention and so on. And I almost thought, I, I don't, I don't want to do it. And then I thought, well, but it's true. That is the default. So maybe we should talk about that, um, about the fact of, of being in that situation. <coughs> so my first question, and I'm warning Susan I'm going to start with her, and so the rest of you get a little more chance to think about it, but um, you've written on the subject um, of and I forget the name of that Brave great monograph. Brave Dames and Wimpets. Brave Dames and Wimpets, right. I know it had dames in the title. Um, and my question is, how, in, in your way of thinking, how are women writers and the books we write different from men writers and the books they write? Because until, well, even now, but essentially we've been living in two separate cultures. Um, Perhaps, um, and certainly the male culture was the dominant one. And I'm, I'm talking about the writing now as opposed to the writers. Mm -hmm. But this is what we absorb. Then along with it, we absorb this is our place in the world. And one of the things I, Compromising Positions was published in 78. Um, and I wasn't quite middle-aged, but moving, <laughs> moving close, so you can calculate. Uh, I, but don't. Um, there was, there was a, there, there of course there were women, um, there, there had been great women novelists, particularly among, uh, among the, uh, the Brits. Um, but they, they really, accepted the world as it was, and if they didn't accept the world as it was, the, the detective, the, the, the narrator, the woman hero, was the darling. She was the chosen one among all women. Well, it sounds a little like the Virgin Mary, but I, <laughs> I don't, don't mean that. But, but she, she was allowed to be adventurous and have a quirk and chew gum and but she was either brilliant a la Dorothy Sayers heroines or she was um, you know she could be maidenly um, like Agatha Christie's but she basically was the one person that men looked to and respected, and the other women were just <laughs> women. Um, they they were part of the population. They were very nice, so, and it it always struck me that women. Why should I be the only women <clears throat> woman who wanted adventure? Women want adventure the way men want adventure. Sometimes it's, it's through reading in an armchair, and sometimes it's going out in the world. But um, so f for my first book, I had a housewife detective who wanted to have an adventure, and she, she took it. She went out in the world, and she was surrounded by other women, some of whom were delightful and daring, and some of whom were, you know, sub-anthropoidal. But that, that, that was letting the woman not be up there, but rather a woman in the real world. And, and it's moved much more toward that. But there's still a lot, especially in the male writers, there's still the woman who's the buddy, who's the, the lover, who's the daring, dangerous one. But it's usually only one. And if she gets killed, then in the next book, there's another oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the John D. MacDonald thing. Mm -hmm. There was a, a girl in each book, never, right. never the same one. Um, but but m 
much young, more recent writers mm -hmm. have done that. Have mm -hmm. done that as well. The girl partner, the girl pal. Right. Lisa, you want to uh, you want to speak to this? The, the the difference between. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I'm not great at speaking to the difference in terms of. I can only say what sort of my goal is mm -hmm. when I'm yeah, writing. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, so my thing is always just like if I'm reading something by a ma man, the woman, the women in the book, uh, even if there's one woman that's got a prominent characteristic, she, they're boring usually. I feel like that's what we're doing when we're writing. We're trying to show women who are more fleshed out. For me, m more, more interesting. I don't care if they're bad, they're good, they're crazy. I just want them to be alive on the page. And I feel like so often you read books by. And, it's, and even often sometimes by women where they're just sort of not there. They're just not doing anything. And I like, I like ordinary in terms of skill sets. I always write about people with sort of who aren't particularly heroic. But I do like oddities because I think if you ever really get to know someone, if they tell you everything about themselves, you're going to find some weird shit there. <laughs> <laughs> OK. You're right. <laughs> Laura, your books are set in the past uh -huh. and, and in, in societies that were much more um, straight-laced than uh -huh. now, and you have a male hero um, for a, a long series, and then you go to Charlotte Bronte, who's a really interesting choice, um, and now with the the, the Ripper, you, is this, this is the start of a new series? Uh -huh. I hope that's yes. what I thought, yes. given who she is. Um, so can you talk about um, uh, talk about the the differences? This is it's, this is a kind of uh, uh, a heavy uh, weight to carry, but the differences in historical writing, um, not not just the differences in crime writing, but in r writing uh, crime historicals between uh, what the men do and what the women are doing. Okay, well, it, it is a different challenge when you're writing a historical novel because you have to be true to the period and. Women, I think their, their role was much more constricted back then. But I like to write about what I call the outliers of women. Like, I don't want to write about somebody who told the line in, in every sense of the word and never could do anything. I mean, how's a person like that going to solve a mystery? Um, but one thing I want to mention is that the difference between male writers and female writers. I used to read male written books and it seemed like invariably within the first couple of chapters there was an attractive female character <laughs> and the first thing she did was stand in front of the mirror and take her clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I have never written that scene myself <laughs> in, in any period. And uh, have you guys written that no. scene? <laughs> Uh, and is that something you routinely do, stand in front of the mirror and take your clothes yeah. off? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, well, I, I got my first job in broadcasting um, in 1970, in 1970. And I got that job because I walked into the radio station and said, I'm here to apply for a job as a reporter. And the news director said, have you ever been a reporter? Have you ever written a story for radio or television or newspapers? And I said, no. And, uh, but I wanted to be a reporter. And he said, fast forward, he said, I'm so sorry you seem like a nice young woman, but I can't hire you. You don't have any experience whatsoever. And I said, he said, can you give me a reason why I should hire you? And I said, well, I can, actually. Um, your license is up for renewal at the FCC right now, and you don't have any women working here. <laughs> and, then I, and then I just smiled, and the next day I had my first job. <laughs> and it was like 40, 40 years ago, right? however many years ago it was. But Susan, I remember reading Compromising Positions, and that moment of reading that book was just as big in sort of my writing life as that moment of, of getting that first radio job was well, in my you. TV life. I mean, it was different and the characters, were the, the woman was real, the women were real and it was real life and I thought, oh, this is a new, this is a new thing, this is a new way that a book can be. And I have told stories um, on television for you know, more than 40 years now. And so those stories are about real people. And so when you say you want them to be quirky and odd and different, you know, as a reporter, you have to be really curious. That's, that is the essence of it. And so that's how I want my characters to be. 
Um, a, a good detective has to be really curious, and so a good reporter has to be really curious, and your brain has to work, wonder what they meant, wonder why they would do that, wonder why it happened that way, wonder why she would do that. And that's, and so I, I, I don't think about, this is horrible, when I read a book by a man that has, I can read a book about, by a man that has a woman who doesn't behave in a way that I think women would behave, and that, that grates on me. But I don't, do we see many books by women where the women don't behave like women would behave? You know, I don't, I don't think so. Depends on, you know, what women you know and what books <laughs> you read. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do, all the time. I'm like, really? <laughs> you go there. Yeah. But, but in those books, do the men also not behave like like real men would behave? I mean, is, are the are How the, do parents? real men behave? <laughs> yeah, well. That's a whole other <laughs> panel, a whole really other panel. Um, but no, that's an interesting question. Are, yeah. are the characters in the service of the author, which yeah. means nobody is behaving oh, yeah. like a real person, because the, I, I had a student once who I asked why this character did this strange thing, and she said, well, because in the beginning of the next chapter, he's downtown. And I said, no, 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 no. That's, that, you mean you need him to be downtown, so you had him do this weird thing? This is not going to work. You know? It has to be what he needs. So there are those books where the characters are, are doing what the author yeah. needs them to do, um, in which case they're all behaving strangely. Right, right. Um, and that's just bad writing. And that's just yes, bad writing, I agree. right. Um, I, I remember um, you were talking about the, the women all coming together, all, all being part of the book, and I remember a story that... Um, uh, Sarah Paretsky told that uh, in uh, her third or fourth book had just come out, and somebody said, you know, this woman is, is not a feminist. She pretends to be, but she isn't. And somebody else said, why? And she said, because is there any feminist you know who, if she tripped over a body, wouldn't call up her entire consciousness-raising group? <laughs> <laughs> she, she just goes up, you know, she doesn't call all her girlfriends. What's the matter with her? Um, so, you know, that's... Uh, that was of the time. Um, <laughs> Sometime. But speaking of Sarah Paretsky, um, she once also, she said early on that um, one thing she would never do to uh, V.I. Warshawski is put her in the position where she was raped or threatened with rape. Hmm. Because this is uh, something to which women are vul vulnerable, to which men are not. And she didn't want that issue as part of um, VI's hmm. kind of daily world. I took exactly the, I, I, having read that, I took exactly the opposite tack when I wrote my first book, because I, and I, I did have Lydia threatened with rape and then someone saves her, because this is what happens. You know, women, every time you walk down the street and you're alone and there's someone coming toward you, it is in your mind. It's in every woman's mind. And I wanted to write real people. Um, on the other hand, it hasn't happened to Lydia. Um, and so I wanted to know, is there anything you would not write about? Anything, any position you would not put a character in, um, either a male or female character, uh, that, that, first of all, is there any such thing? And secondly, <laughs> what is it? And third, is it because you're a female writer? Huh. Because I, I also want to say that there are things that I won't have, say, for example, Lydia's mother do because it's too much of a caricature of mothers. Um, and I don't think that that's, hmm. you know, it's, it, it's an easy laugh, but my mother wouldn't have liked it, you know. So, <laughs> so um, let's, Hank, let's start with you. Oh, gosh. We ended with you last. Um, you can't make Susan start all the time. You can. <laughs> um, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I think I don't, sometimes I finish sentences. Um, <laughs> I don't use graphic violence. I think if you have people's eyes sewn shut or something to make your story go, you need a better story. You know, just do something better and then you don't need to have that um, thing that makes the reader be so squeamish that you don't even, you don't even, I don't think my books need that. But you bring up rape and that's so, interesting because my book, Say No More, is about campus sexual assault. Um, and it was, you know, I'm sitting at my desk trying to write this book and trying to make it real and trying to make it kind of unflinching but not, 
you know, how do you write about rape and not have it be violent? But I want it to be important and I want it to be big. So, and I thought, it's so much more difficult to write about rape than it is to write about murder. You know, why is that? You know, why is that? So that was, that was really consciousness raising for me to, to do that. Um, is there something I wouldn't write about? <sighs> Torturing children? You know, why? You know, you wouldn't. I mean, why would you do that? Although in my new book, that'll be out someday. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> um, but there are people who are, there are children who are dead, and that worried me. That worried me quite a bit. And so why is that another line that seems, I don't know, people die all the time, but why does that seem too creepy. Is there a too creepy? Lisa, let's move right down the line. Okay. I, I, maybe, I don't know. I mean, I have this sort of, I have rules about no rules. Um, I wouldn't write about serial killers, but not because of the creepy factor, but just, there was a time when there were so many books about serial killers, I thought they should have a union. <laughs> and so that was why, and I just thought, oh, we keep making serial killers interesting when they're actually mostly really boring and gross. So I'm more interested in like not writing about things that uh, just don't feel like you can say anything new. Hmm. Uh, I, but I'm sure that there are things I don't write about, but I would hope that it's not just because I'm a woman. Like, you know, some, sometimes I think people go really far just for the shock value. And if I feel like I'm being cheap like that, which I have done, and then deleted. Oh, well, interesting. Uh, or my editor had me delete. <laughs> I don't think I was really trying exactly for shock value, but I was pushing it. But, but you know, yeah, I don't know. But I generally don't like rules. I don't like rules for myself. You can have all your, the rules you want. Not for me, though. <laughs> Susan. Um, <clears throat> I don't have rules either. Um, but there, because whatever I write arises out of my imagination and <clears throat> if in the course of this trip to the other universe that I take five or six days a week um, and I'm in that other universe something some, something occurs it may not be something I like or approve of um, but I'll write about it I um, I think if you if you establish rules, there are books I won't read, like serial killer books, um, but that's because so many of them, besides being predictable, um, are about violence to women. And it's an excuse for almost pornographic description yeah. of disgusting things being done. And then to counterbalance that, there's usually um, either a woman detective or a woman, you know, some some feisty, <laughs> which is you know a word, a word yeah. never maybe it's, it's used to describe short Irish men, but nobody else <laughs> except women. Um, Fox terriers. <laughs> uh, I. I really um, think that by having rules saying, I won't write about this, I won't write about this, your own taste, your own past, your own experience will, will just push you away from anything that's wrong for you. And, and don't say I won't write. In my mind, you're, you're limiting your... Um, your imagination and your freedom by thinking, I won't do this. Sit down. That's why <laughs> God invented <laughs> keyboards and, and go to it. <laughs> Laura. Okay, well, for me, this gets back to the question of differences between male and female authors. Um, when I lived in New Orleans, I belonged to a, a writing critique group for about 20 years. And uh, there was a man in the group, um, one of my good friends actually, and he was writing a detective novel that had a female prostitute for a main character. And the women in the group had problems with this. You know, we, uh, we had criticisms and 
you know, we didn't like the idea very much, but all the was men it, were like... Me, was the, it was the idea or was the way he executed it? Well, it was both. It was both, really. I mean, there were definite problems with the way he executed it, you know, execute in every sense of the word. <laughs> but, um, you know, none of the men had any problems with this. So it's like, what? You know? So then years later, I moved to New York, and one of the first few writers I met was a man who was also writing a novel, a mystery novel, where the heroine was a female prostitute. And I was thinking, you know, I, I haven't met any women who are doing this. You know, this seems to be a guy thing. I mean, admittedly, <laughs> this is a small sample, you know, two, two writers groups, you know, two guys. Right? But, you know, I, I think that's probably something that I would just not do because the idea of a prostitute as a detective, I mean, there's a lot of things in her life that would just really interfere with solving <laughs> history, <laughs> if nothing else. But talk about undercover. Wait, yeah, undercover. You, you didn't yeah. say prostitute detective. Yeah, prostitute. I would totally prostitute. read that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, so, that sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but you know, I was saying, you know, this is this is probably not something that I would write. It's not that I don't write about characters who are prostitutes. I mean, if you write about Jack the Ripper, you kind of have to. <laughs> and that's that's an interesting um, interesting question because I well, you're, you're you're talking then about the the reality of it that that yeah, a the prostitute would, would have trouble doing that um, and a lot and, of and, problems and yeah yeah the interesting drugs? You know, yeah. just a lot of problems. I mean, yeah. but but it is, was this um, for you and the women in your group a, a moral issue also that that of of glamorizing prostitution? That was part of it because the the prostitute in, in this case was you know kind of a very cartoonish character and that was one problem with it because you know I, I guess the the cartoonish aspect just didn't go over real well but. I guess I, I tend to think of in a, at least a classic mystery or detective story, the detective has to operate from something of a position of strength at least some of the time. And I, I just don't see that happening with like a realistic prostitute. Yeah, you know, a, a cartoonish, action, adventurish kind of character maybe, but I guess you, you know, can do, I guess if it, if it all is if it works. I mean, well, if, yeah, it I mean works, yeah, if, if it, it works, works, you can, you can do it. Then it would be yeah. pretty great. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. You know, it just, if it, but you were saying it didn't work, and that was what was wrong with yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think it would be awfully hard to make work, you know, which is one I'm going to try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you Next can year at this I time. All right, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa has to go now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. wait a sec. <laughs> what, was, what was the title on yeah. it? I can come up with my own title. It's interesting because there's a a guy I know, a writer I know, who's writing a woman, Heroin in his in his new series, and he's always giving me stuff to read. And I'm and there was one where um, she had she's a reporter and she had come to this place to interview this guy. And instead of him meeting her at the hotel, another guy met her at the hotel and said um, he's actually on that island. We have to get in the boat and go there. And this was going to be the story of the century. Um, and so she got in the boat. And I said no 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 no. No woman is ever going to get into a boat with a man she wasn't expecting to go somewhere where she doesn't know where it is to meet somebody she's never met before, no matter if it is the story of the century. She's not going to do it. She's not going to do it alone. You have to find a way to have someone else with her. So. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> and I, think you, I, I think it's kind of interesting because I'm thinking, oh, I'd go. Then I think, would I go? I would tell somebody. I would, you, take, I would take somebody with me. I would say, take, sure. Right. And uh, that's, in the end, um, he um, found a photographer yeah. on the island yeah. to go with her yeah. to take pictures of the encounter. Yeah. And I would do that. I think any, any woman yeah. who, who wanted an adventure would do that. But nobody's just going to get in the boat and go. Um, I thought that that yeah, was... Yeah, that's, that's kind yeah. of a criticism that I hear about a lot of stories, and especially movies, like, oh, they would never go in the basement. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then I, I remember writing about my samurai detective, and their code of honor was such that, you know, if you go into a battle or any kind of situation, scary situation, you better come out with the head of your enemy or without your own. You know, so yeah. in that culture... You had mm -hmm. to go in the basement. Right, but that's a different yeah, thing because different, the people who yeah. go in the basement 
are people who say, ooh, there's a scary noise down there, let's go see what it is. Yeah. Not yeah. people who say, there's a scary noise down there and I really would rather not go, but my code says I have yeah. to. Yeah. So that's, that's then fitting into the, um, the, the world that you're creating. Uh -huh. so. But the, the, the question is, we, we're saying, no woman would get into a boat with it. But what about a guy? Would a guy get into I mean, see, I think there's, there's still a kind of double standard. Yeah, no, you know, absolutely. Basically, yeah. you have to be a schmendrick to get into a boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but if yeah. you're a schmendrick with martial arts skills, maybe you would. Well, and, and, if his, and, if, and if this character had had martial arts skills, maybe right. she would. Um, it's funny, because I said, you know, no woman is ever going to do that. And he said, really? I hadn't thought about that. I mean, if I wanted to get that story, I would get in the boat, and then if the guy tried to kill me, I would kill him right back. <laughs> okay? Um, this is not how most women think, you know? It's just a person thing. Would a person yeah. go? Yeah, I don't think any person, but I, certainly not any woman I know. Um, so I, we're going to turn this over to questions from the audience really soon. Would you um, go in the boat? No. Yeah, right. How many of you would go in the boat? Um, but I, I actually don't know what time it is, so somebody will have to tell me. Jonathan will have to tell me. We're moving along? All right, all right. So I'm going to ask another question, and then maybe we will um, open it. I At once? At the same time. Just have a conversation. All right. Um, well, I, I, what I want is, well, if you, you know, a conversation about writing. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let's ask, let's ask the, the kind of obvious question, which is, what is your schedule? How do you work? Are you, are you, you know, st what? I was going to ask something more pointed and obnoxious. Oh, okay, come on. If it's your process, do you, if, you know, women, you know, is there something about being a woman that might interfere, like you might have <laughs> kids and the husband's <gasps> not dealing with it? Is there that issue if in your writing process that screws it up? And, you know, what's different? All right, what's different? Did about, I say that aggressively enough? Um, <laughs> yeah, but the turning sideways is good, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and crossing your legs to cover. Uh, <laughs> OK, is there something different? Was there something different when you began? Um, do you think you would have begun sooner if you'd been a man? Um, would you have put your weight down more firmly and not kept a second job or whatever? Um, and let's, let's start with Laura, because Laura has had so many professions. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe, maybe I'll say something that might be kind of obnoxious to some people. But uh, can I you be obnoxious that, to him? Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll aim it right at you. But I, I think that one, one difference that I have noticed about myself and many other female writers as opposed to male writers is it seems like male writers very often have somebody, usually a woman, helping them with their writing. And it came to the point where I was thinking, you know, maybe a lot of these guys are not actually writing their books at all because the <laughs> women who are helping them type are maybe doing a lot more than typing. Interesting. And, you know, I, I have actually done a lot of this myself. Um, my husband, Marty Rowland, is sitting over there. I'm going to pick on him. <laughs> so at, at the time I was writing the first book in my Samurai Detective series, Marty was also trying to finish his master's thesis. So uh, who do you think was typing for whom? <laughs> Well, he wasn't typing for me, you know, I was writing my first book. I mean, glad, glad to say that he got the master's thesis out of the way, and I got the first book and, you know, the next 17 books in the series out of the way. But, you know, ha have you noticed that? There's, there's this, like, unevenness in the helpmate. <laughs> well, in the, in, the, in the helpmate thing, not, I mean, this, the specific, you know, whether the women are writing the books. The only time I've, I heard that was, um, oh, his name just went right out of my mind. English Six horses. Yeah. Dick Francis. Dick Francis, Dick Francis. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Who, the, the rumor had been for a long time yeah. that she was that, writing you know, the books. She may have been yeah. typing yeah. for yeah. a while. There, there's but, a, yeah. novel, a novel, about, a wonderful novel, called The Wife by Meg Wallitzer, mm. which is about that. Really about where, where the wife is actually doing the writing, but I'm not saying. Um, <laughs> I mean that's no that's the that's the conceit behind um, yeah. the Private Eye TV show Remington Steele, yeah. yeah, where she could not get work as a Private Eye, so she hired him, and he had no idea what he was doing, yeah. and and but he was the Private Eye, and she was the Girl Friday, and it was kind of great. I, I loved it. Um, are there are there other differences? Are there other things that that any of you? Um, I'm getting confused about what we're 
Like, what we're talking about? Yeah, wow. kind of. Because it's like, are we talking about like our experiences? Yes, of, yes, oh, yes. Okay. yes, your own experience. Well, I don't have anybody yeah. writing for me, <laughs> although I wish I did. Um, but yeah, I don't, I think for me it doesn't, the family thing doesn't apply. So uh -huh. I, I could just be a guy who decided to write a book. But would you have started sooner, do you think, if you had been a guy? Or? Why? I don't, nothing uh, would have changed. I mean, there wasn't. I don't, yeah, I can't okay. really. I just don't see that as a thing. I mean, in, in any way, that w my life changed as a writer when I had a good idea. You know, I thought I can, I can do this. I could, I could write a book. And I, had a, I knew I had a good idea. And there, if I had tried to do it sooner in my career, I couldn't. I wasn't the person I was at the time that I started to write. So it was all about the idea and the place where I was. Um, I, you know, I said to my husband, I've got this great idea for a novel. I'm going to write a mystery. And he's like, great, sweetheart. Do you, do you know how to write a novel? <laughs> and I'm like, sure, how hard can it be? You know, I've read a million of them. I mean, I was so, <laughs> so naive about it. I mean, so carried away by this good idea. And it was, you know, I think things happen at the time they're supposed to happen. And so that was the time it was supposed to happen. And it was a, a life-changing thing. You know, in my life, um, you know, you have things that you, my husband takes out the trash. You know, I make, I, I cook. Nobody really talks about it. It's just what is. He's a criminal defense attorney, so he knows that I can go, I need somebody to be in custody for eight hours and not be arrested. You know, tell me what they, how, what should I have the cops say? You know, it's good to have in-house counsel. <laughs> <laughs> I read his, talk about writing, you know, I read and help him with his closing arguments in criminal cases because I tell stories. So it's a nice, it's a, it's a good thing, but it had nothing to do really with being a woman at a time. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> with me, it did. Uh, well, I had worked, um, I had basically two jobs. I was writing advice to the love lorn under the name of Abigail Wood at Seventeen Magazine, then became an editor there. <clears throat> I was also freelancing political speeches. Uh, at night, because my husband was then prosecuting, not now he's defending, uh, but uh, he was, um, he worked long hours. And, uh, but then the ba one baby came, and then another baby came, and suddenly I was, I'd never, we'd always, both of us had always lived in apartments. Suddenly I was in a house in the suburbs, <laughs> and uh, it was a, a very different life. Um, I started reading mysteries, and that was all I started reading, and, and, and finally, you know, probably became demented. But <laughs> I said, I can do this, and I decided to write a, to make it a, a housewife. Uh, did I know I could write? Sure, I could write, because I earned money yeah. writing. But it was not until my younger one, who is now in her 40s and a philosopher, but she was then, you know, a little teeny thing, um, went off to nursery school that I had three hours a day. Mm -hmm. I set the alarm, the alarm rang, I went and I got her off the school bus. But those three hours. I hear that though from women, a lot of women. From, well, it's also, but see, it's also good because I also had somebody than supporting me because I didn't yeah. have make enough at freelancing. I, the freelancing political speeches continued, but I didn't make enough money to really, you know, live even not grandly. And um, so, and I also had um, the leisure of, of sending her to, to preschool and, you know, my son was in kindergarten. Um, and I had the leisure of those three hours and a room, a room of one's own. So, so that's, that's all you needed. Listen, writing is a job. And anyone who waits for the muse to perch on her shoulder or his shoulder is, in my opinion, foolish. Uh, there may be, there are some writers who who do it, but it's a job. And very often, most people have, have two jobs. Yeah. So the, the upside, well, all right, being, being a housewife, I suppose, was a job. I never really thought of it as that. I, 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 you know, 
despite the entire women's movement yelling that this is this is work too. I never thought of it as that. But um, you have to have an enormous energy and you have to go to work every day as you do job number one. And you have to have so much discipline to juggle. But but you also want to get out of this, you know, very sweet but slightly boring world <laughs> that in which you all of us, I mean, male and female writers, this is just doesn't apply to women. We want to create another universe. We want to be God with a small G and, and make something else, create other lives. So you right. got to do it. You got to put your ass on the on the chair and go to it. And that segues. Do I have time for one more question before we? Uh... No, I think oh, all right. Oh, wait. Well, but I. Okay, never mind. And if I don't get to do it, I'm going to do it anyway. But yes, <laughs> questions from the audience. Okay, one here, one there, and then one there. Yes, ma'am, in the white. Okay, advice, I, I'm repeating these for because the, this is being recorded, right? Um, advice for someone who's working on her first book um, about working on the book and about getting, getting it published. Um, not about working on the book. Oh, not about working on the book, about getting it published, because I think that Susan just gave you all the advice about exactly. working on a book that you will ever need. Um, but about getting it published, does anybody have any bright ideas? Well, you, you're doing, require, are you querying? Are you querying uh, agents? You gotta no. get an agent. Okay, so no. first, if the book's done, is the book done? No. Okay, okay. well, forget yeah. about it. The book has to be done. <laughs> yeah. And then right. you have to right. do it again, and then again. And then you look for an agent. I mean, there's, yeah. no, there's no shortcut about it. There's no getting to the fun part. There's no, no. doing it fast. Yeah. You know, it takes so much, it takes so much longer than you think it will take <laughs> to, make it, to make it be good. You know, you can be done with a draft. It's not. I, it's not going to be good, and it just isn't. And so you have to keep going through it and thinking about it. And you—it's hard. Just, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think Lisa was—you're both right. Um, you you cannot assume there will be an editor who likes the cut of your jib or your style or whatever, and will help you develop this book, a la Maxwell Perkins, because Maxwell Perkins is dead. <laughs> and hasn't been and replaced. Was, so you have to yeah, make the book the best possible book you can, which means writing and rewriting. I strongly suggest you go online. There, I'm chairman of this organization, um, Poets and Writers, pw.org. It, it tends toward the more literary, but don't let that <laughs> stop anybody. Um, it uh, has wonderful articles and information about how to find an agent, how to do this, how to do that, how to get self-published. Whatever it is, it's there, and it's an excellent website. Thank you. I had an editor who said, I had a, I'm sorry, an agent friend who said, she will look at a book that's, she'll, she'll take a book that's 95% to where it should be. But anything under 95%, she's just not going to deal with that. Uh, but that's a book that's finished, yeah, but, but no, not but 90. Yeah, yeah. 95% good, yeah. but a finished, the best yeah. you can possibly make it be. Yeah, yeah. But so. Well, a agents are, are not going to look at anything that isn't done. They don't have time. And if they right. took you on, what would they do with it anyway? Yeah. Well, it, it isn't done. So, right. so that, I think, you, you really need a, a finished book first. And then there are three ways you can get published traditionally, traditionally with a small press or self-published. And you can think about those when the, when the book is done, because they're, they are different pathways. Um, another question. Uh, Jeff, you had a question. Yeah, uh, my question is for Hank. Uh, do, you, do you think it was more difficult to write about rape than murder because the victim survived? I, I think that's exactly right, and that's what I came to too. And you came to it like that, and it took me a long time, <laughs> because you—it's it, one of the—it's one of the reasons. But it, the when you are writing about rape and campus sexual assault, as I am, um, the, that those there have to be characters who have lived through that, and then you have to figure out what's a fair and truthful and honest reaction 
to that. If somebody's dead, I mean, it's a murder mystery. Somebody's going to get killed. That's what we write. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm very careful to be careful of that victim also. That victim isn't just a paper cutout that's in the book that you kill because that's what you're writing. But there's a reason, and that was a person. And there, you know, all the ripples that come out of that. But they don't talk back except in other ways. But the, um, uh, a rape victim is on stage in the book. Um, and you have to be true to that. And that, that was a, um, a wonderful challenge. But I, I was very, like, I felt very um, respectful of, the, of making it be right and good and still, you know, entertaining. That's the, you know, <laughs> that's a hard thing. There was a question here. Um, there, there are uh, so many different uh, detective novels out in the market and over a long period of time. Uh, how, do you, how, do, how do you stay fresh and always come up with an idea that, that really could stand out? I mean, it, it, just because it, um, one doesn't want to obviously probably write something that someone else has written or an idea that somebody else has written, and you don't want to repeat maybe the same thing. But I was just wondering how, how do you really stay fresh in front of the market that seems saturated with so many books? Let me, let me repeat that, because I didn't repeat the other one, although I think we, we got it. Um, but how do you, there are so many books out, how do you stay fresh, come up with new ideas, stay out in front of the market instead of um, writing something that has already been written? I think it's not thinking about what's already been written. It, there, you're always having obsessions. I mean, I had somebody just say, just sort of focus on your obsessions. So I always think about, like, what is it I want to be thinking about for a really long time? And then I work it around that. But I, I always have written without ever thinking about what other people do. It's really important. And that's important for selling your book, too. Someone else want to take that? No? I think it's a matter of finding the intersection of what you love, what you're obsessed with, what you're passionate about, whatever, and what other people are wanting to buy and read. And that, that can be a tricky thing, but I think it starts with the passion and the love and the willingness to stick to it before it ever gets to the point of what somebody wants to buy. And if you think about it the other way, well, what does somebody want to buy? Well. I guess we would have all been writing uh, Da Vinci Code poems or something. <laughs> but you think about you think about what is it happens. You think about yeah. what is it that you would love to read? What would rivet you? What would make you you know when you when you when I'm writing and sometimes I sometimes I forget that I wrote it. You know if I'm looking and editing I forget that I wrote it and I think and that's if I can get to that, you know that's that then I know I'm I'm better than I thought at that particular paragraph. But you know, you have a good. You, I start with like this good idea, and it's not anything that has any any comparison to any other good idea. It's just my good idea that when I drop sort of into the pond of my mind, the ripples start going out, and I think, I God, this is gonna work. You know, it's a good story. It's a good story. That's all. It's really about. Anne. Um, how do any of you feel? Or let me ask it this way: Do you, any of you have sympathy for your criminals? Yes, sir. <laughs> do, do you have sympathy for your criminals? Do you have sympathy for your criminals? Always. You should have sympathy for every character you write. You can't write a character you hate or don't understand. And if you are, you're not writing the character well, I think. Well, since all my characters are really me, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm acting and cross-dressing like crazy when I'm writing my books. You know, I'm, I'm all of them, so you know, how could I not have sympathy? For, I mean, I treat them horribly, but you know, that's a different thing. <laughs> I love that answer. Um, it, it's almost, I don't think of myself because I'm, I'm in the head of the detective. You know, some of my, my novels are not detective novels, but I'm, but I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the head of of um, my investigator, and I'm I'm seeing it through his or her eyes because I've written first person as a man mm -hmm. as well, um, and so sympathy, empathy, as much as that character has, because the whole 
point of the writing for me is to lose, you know, Susan Isaacs, rapidly aging Long Island person <laughs> and to think through the, my new, I'm starting a, a series, I'm working on the first one now and it's the first series, I've done two with the same character, this is the first series um, and she's, she's 38 so my, which is you know, a really nice age, and she's a, a, a former FBI agent, and et cetera, et cetera, um, fluent in Arabic, uh, lots of interesting things about her. But basically, I've had to read a lot of Arabic literature. I have to think 38, yeah. which is, <laughs> you know, a, a, a leap, but one worth taking. Um, 38 now. 38 Not now. when we were 38. No, no. You know what I mean? It's a different 38. Uh, of course it is. Yes, absolutely. But fortunately, I have, you know, friends. I have in-laws, in-law children. I have... But the thing, the idea is not to think of you, do I have sympathy with, you know, this, this, uh, this murderer, this rapist. This, you have understanding um, you might even have empathy, but it, it doesn't matter. You matter less than the narrator, whether it's well, yes. first person or I third mean, person. Would, your, would any of your lead characters yeah. be considered an empath, yeah. or can you write it from this from the point of view of the criminal? Um, can I write it from the point of view of the criminal? That wouldn't be my my style, but. Yeah, but people Go people ahead. do it all people the time. People do it all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. So why so, not? So, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you might get it. Lisa's, <laughs> you know, or Lisa's I, writing that one down to go with a prostitute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh pardon me. Oh. Oh, what, what, I, I, there's a question. Of, well, okay, there's a civilian has a question. So how do you decide who has to die? Lisa wrote a series of six, pe of six books where nobody died. So, Some died of natural causes. Well, right. <laughs> murder. So yeah. does it have to be murder? Okay, how, how do you, does oh. it have to be murder and how do you decide who has to die? Who, who do you most want to kill? <laughs> <laughs> I, my first novel, I, I was, I had some gum problems. I murdered a periodontist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, and my, my own husband complains that I've, um, I've off too many husbands, but, <laughs> but I haven't. You know, he's still around. So, um, he, he should, he's lucky you offed all those husbands <laughs> yeah. in fiction. That's right. But um, does it have to, murder, it, no, it doesn't have to be anything. It has to be what you want to write. I think it was Hank Elisa said it's about writing the book you most want to read. Um, and that's, that's what you're doing. So, and Again, I, don't don't limit yourself. And I don't know. I don't use an outline at all. So it's always a surprise to me when the person gets killed. <laughs> I mean, so, and that's part of the fun of it. So I don't plan this person will live and this person will die. I don't know. I don't know who's going to die. And when they do, sometimes I think, oh, well, that's too bad. <laughs> um, well, I guess that has to happen. So it's like life. You don't know. Like real life, you don't know when someone's going to die, and that's exactly what happens in the book. It unfolds, sort of like a news story. Like our lives unfold, and some things are a surprise, and some things are sad. Some things are like the dentist thing, kind of just, you know. <laughs> no offense to dentists, but that's part of the joy of it to me—not the killing part, but that it's a <laughs> that it's it's hard for me to. I mean, it, it's hard for me to kill somebody in a book. That's the other thing. That's not the fun part for me. When people say, ooh, I killed my boss, I love that. Um, I, don't, I don't have that. Well, from a publishing standpoint, I was once told to move up the body, you know, like I hadn't had the murder soon enough. So, you know, that, that's something that if you're writing books that could be considered genre mysteries, that, that could be an issue. But if you're writing other types of stories where there's a mystery and there may be a death or a crime, but, you know, it's, it's not like the classic type of mystery, you can get away with a lot of different things. One, one of the reasons there's usually a body is because it's, it's high stakes. 
as long as the stakes are high enough to keep your reader involved, and what could be more high stakes than right. a murder where you don't know who, who the murderer is and they're still walking around. And, um, but no, you don't, you don't have to do that if you have a good story that doesn't involve a murder, as long as you have stakes. And that's why they, they want the body up front. You know, they say the body has to be on the first page. It really doesn't. But something has to happen on the first page <laughs> to make your reader go to the second page. And a body is, it's, I, I kind of think it's cheap to put the body on the first page, but it does work. It does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As one girl has been very cheap and mm. <laughs> It does work. Um, another question back here. Um, yeah, you. Yeah, I was wondering if any of you, with all your expertise in uh, crime, writing crime fiction, has thought about taking a stab at writing true crime, and if so, how you would approach the writing differently. If any of these writers, uh, with all their expertise in writing crime fiction, have thought about writing true crime, and if so, how they would approach it. No. <laughs> well, I, my n new book, God willing, um, is about a woman who's a writer who has decided to write true crime. And so I, have to th I had to really think about how I would write true crime, even though I'm writing fiction about writing true crime. That's very meta. Isn't it? <laughs> um, but as a reporter, I'm writing true crime all the time. True, true crime. So, um, and it makes me realize how much we have no idea what true is in true crime. How would you know? You know, it's, you know, how did, how did Truman Capote know what they all said, what they, the Clutter family said to each other, they died. And it's, so some of it has to be sort of made up. So then I'm thinking, oh, that's, that's so interesting, that true crime is kind of made up, and that's sort of what the book is. And that's what would make me be fascinated about writing about true crime a book rather than just you know, a 10-minute news story, because how, 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 do you, how do we ever know what's true? And that's the interesting thing of the book. Non, true crime nonfiction is just like fiction in that it has a voice. It has, and the best true crime that I've read, I have no desire to write it, but the best true crime I've read has great style and a strong voice and a point of view. Um, and uh, that's, that's what you should strive for. Um, good luck. Is that what you're doing? Okay, there's a question over here and a question over there. Well, I don't but we don't, have yeah. Oh, all right, well, let's have the question uh, over here. So you spoke about whether or not you feel uh, whether there's a difference between being a female and male crime writer. And some of you said, yes, I'm, I'm conscious of it. Some said no. What about how the industry looks at women crime writers as opposed to men? Oh, boy, here's a good ending question. Um, how the industry looks at women crime writers as opposed to how it looks at, at men crime writers. Who wants to take that? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lisa. Go ahead. No, Can Laura, Lisa. Okay. But listen, um, okay. Uh, I think it's, it's gotten, especially in the mystery field, it's, it's gotten a lot of better. The majority of readers are women. But then you look at Lee Childs, the majority of his readers are women. Um, he writes about a really, you know, Jack Reacher, a really big, tough, violent guy. But he's, he's marvelous. I mean, I love, I love those books. Um, he, he does as well as job. I think ultimately it's a question of economics. And if it's... Uh, if it reads well, if it's if it's not, um, it it certainly can be a genre type fiction, or you know have a. Um, you could have had what was the name of the rose, you know a medieval monk, detective go on and on and on and on through many books. If the style of the writing is terrific, people will buy it. It. It, religion doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, you know, whatever. It's, it's how good you are. And, and 
ideally, in an ideal universe, which this is not, but often someone will find, some, some really terrific writers have come up, they've come up from being self-published, they've come up from small presses, and just from out of nowhere, because they, they have something unique to them, which is the sound of their voice. That's all you have. All right, on the sound of the voice, I think mm -hmm. we, yeah. we need to end. Is yes. That, yes. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan wants to say a few more words, so. No, I, I'll just, yeah, okay. Um, it was funny because what I was gonna say before Suzanne Solomon, who's also a wonderful writer, asked that question was that nowadays, I mean, it's, it's basically, and I've read so many things that, that acknowledge this, that women crime writers are, you know, some of the best writers now, best crime writers are women. Uh, most of the readers are women, men are illiterate and don't read. So why would women still feel ghettoized in particular? So, you know, I don't know that, yeah. Right? Except that this is a panel on women crime writers and there is no panel on men crime writers. No, there probably should be. Yeah, but there I is. I mean, <laughs> you know. And, and at none of the conventions, oh, yeah. you know, so sure. that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I know, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 will, I will just say that I said something the other day about a woman writer who I like, and my daughter said, spoken like the true patriarchy. And I said, I am your patriarch. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, it's so great to have you all here. And I want to say at the beginning, uh, all these great writers, just great writers. Not women writers, but just great writers. Um, and please come in the back. You have an opportunity to buy this thing called a book have it signed by these writers, have a drink, say hello. You can't stop them on the way. You must buy a book if you want to talk to them personally. <laughs> <laughs>